Now? 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 Yeah. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> How are you all today? Good. It's good to be with the family. Amen. Amen. Remember, I always say this is our family time, our Thanksgiving. It doesn't come in November, it comes in August. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Let us bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before your holy presence now. Waiting to hear your voice, Lord. Not the voice of our men. Your dear children have come from various nations, from various states of this land, and even all those who are watching online who have come to this conference to hear your voice, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us last night and this morning. We commit this session into your holy hands. And we invite your holy throne to be enthroned, to be established in our midst right now. Come, Lord Jesus. Be enthroned in our midst right now. <coughs> Make your ways and your will known to us. We are at a crossroad. We desperately need to hear what are your plans, what are your purposes, and what is your will, Lord? Where should we go from now onwards? And what we should do? Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Even now, Lord, we thank you for your holy angels who have been stationed in our midst all throughout this auditorium. And I pray you will unf unfold yourself to us according to each and every one of their faith. And I pray, as your word tells us, give us a listening ear and an understanding heart to hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to us in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Amen. <coughs> uh, two days ago, when when we first arrived here on the 5th of August. So Brother Naval, he arrived in the morning and I arrived at noon. So that evening, or the following day, we met together to have, you know, catch up our fellowship, you know. So as we were talking and discussing what God is speaking or saying over many issues, and then the topic centered around this nation. And we shared, compared notes, what God is speaking. And there was perfect agreement with what God has been speaking, though we are continents apart. Australia is a continent by itself. India is known as a subcontinent. Yet, we all serve the same living God. Amen. Amen. And our God sits on the throne. Yes. And he rules the entire universe from that throne. So when he gives out a message, it will always be the same. Isn't it? Yes. Although they may have some cultural variations, because we sometimes understand differently. So God condescends to speak to us 
according to our cultural understanding. But essentially, the message is the same. When, you, when it comes out, when you put it down in writing, that is the same message. So, after that, I kept on pondering very much and asking the Lord very specifically what He wanted me to speak at this conference. You know, in all the many previous years, Pastor Joe Sweet used to have a team for this conference. And we try to, wherever I go, it's my habit to stick to the team. So I pray and ask the Lord, Lord, this is the team they have, so give me a word. But lately, he has changed the team. So the team for this conference is, there is no team. <laughs> that is the team, you know. To have no team is a team. So that the Holy Spirit can speak to us according to what is in the heart of God. Yes. Amen? Yes. So, based on that, I began to pray and seek the Lord what I should speak. And last night, during the worship sessions, as the worship was going on, I was caught up into many visions and experiences concerning God's way of looking at the United States of America. So that's what I'm going to share tonight, building up from where our dear and respected prophet of God, Neville Johnson, left off last night. My message is entitled, The Destiny of the United States of America. You know, there is a prophetic council in heaven that determines the destinies of nations and leaders and chief ministers of God. There is a council, a council of elders, a council of prophets, many, many different councils that oversee many different functions in heaven. Heaven is not just a place where you just go and rest in the suite by and by with a harp. <laughs> I don't know where in the world we got all those kind of uh, teachings on, you know. It is a place where it's full of activity. Full of activity. Every part of heaven, there's something going on, you know. And they are different, different, just like we have earthly committees. This committee, that committee, there are councils of elders, councils of prophets who gather and they discuss and make plans. If you read in the Holy Bible, in Daniel chapter 4, verses 4 to 27, there you will find of a council that is mentioned, particularly verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent <coughs> that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and set it up over it the basis of men. Please look at the first part of this scripture where it says, this matter, this word, or this dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had, that matter is by the decree of the watchers. So that's not one watcher, but many watchers. And the demand by the word of the holy ones. Now who exactly are the holy ones, we do not know. But here it seems to refer or infer there's this council. Council of watchers and the holy ones who decree or they pass judgment. Said at this particular time this thing should take place. At that particular time this should take place. You know the collective 
judgments of God that are written in the scrolls of heaven, they are then entrusted to certain particular councils. So they are given to them and their duty is to look at the whole council of God and then according to its predetermined time to watch over the events that unfold on earth and then compare them with what God has determined and then at its time they proclaim the decree all right since this was spoken and since this has now taken place therefore this shall be done so they proclaim the decree so here we read a good solid biblical example concerning the councils in heaven in the year November 2008 just a few days before the US presidential elections you know, I was flying from Louisiana to Texas to go to Houston for a three days of meeting but when we reached near Houston for some reason due to bad weather the pilot could not go towards Houston but he was heading towards Austin you know normally when there's a bad weather something like that they will land at the nearest airport which was at Austin but instead of landing at Austin the pilot was just circling around Austin and he made the announcement now because of bad weather we could not go to Houston so we are circling around Austin so I was I was wondering why don't they want to land at Austin why are they circling up in the air for whatever reasons only the pilots know so I thought to myself all right since we are circling up in the air closer to heaven <laughs> let me pray for the presidential elections you know that was at a very crucial time of your destiny you know all the Christians were praying for godly Christian charismatic president and vice president to come to office Do you remember that I do wish for that so as I was praying suddenly I was caught up into heaven and I found myself at a council and in that council there was a white round table you know, like, like the oval tables that are in a conference room and two aged looking saints were seated at the table one of them I recognized to be Abraham and the other was Moses so when I came and stood before them Abraham motioned he said please come and take your seat here you know in the Indian culture we don't sit before elders that is our culture so I came and stood I said no sir I will stand so I said no 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 you are part of our council please come and sit here again you know my cultural thing came even when I'm up there <laughs> I said I said no sir I'll just stand here so I came closer to the chair I said sir I'll just stand here he said no 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 please sit down so I sat down and then I noticed that there was a file in Abraham's hand and on the file was written the word United States of America so he had the file in his hand and he put it down he looked at me and he said it has been determined Obama will come to office I said sir how can that be all the Christians are praying that he should not come to office but this <laughs> you know I pleaded like what Abraham himself did before the Lord for Sodom and Gomorrah I said how can you be sir so many Christians are praying even I myself am praying 
then he looked at me and said, no, it has been determined. God is giving them a man after their own heart. And this is what he will do during his term of office. They wanted a man who will boost up the economy. They wanted a man who will do this, that and this. He named them one by one. But after he comes to office, all the promises that he made, none of them will come to pass. And then the people will realize that they have chosen the wrong man. So again I pleaded, sir, but what about all the godly Christians? Well, they will suffer. So he looked at me and said, go and tell them, all those who are truly godly, God will watch over them. Their bread and their water is sure. And then he pleaded again. He said, sir, please reconsider. He looked at me and said, you may not go back. <laughs> you know, as wonderful as such experiences may seem, but it was not, not a pleasant, pleasant thing to be part of a witness to such decision-making decrees that are made. So when I come, came out of that experience, at the meeting in Chicago, just a day before the elections, I told the people what I saw. Most Americans could not accept it. I say it doesn't matter whether you accept or you don't accept. It doesn't matter. I am telling you what has been decreed. Take it or leave it. Tomorrow I'm going home. <laughs> Isn't it? Anyway, to the great shock of all Christians, that was the result. Why am I sharing this with you? To show you the reality of councils in heaven. That they are councils. And they are even councils over every nation. And certain councils are there that are appointed to oversee the affairs of the nations. On January the 1st, the 2013, now I'm going to give you some highlights or an overview of what the Lord has spoken to me this past few years concerning the United States of America. And then I will tell you what the Lord spoke to me concerning the United States early this morning. So to trace all what has happened, what has been happening. On January 1st, the year 2013, this was the word that came unto me. USA's cup is almost full and will come before God for a remembrance. She will be humbled and made to eat dust. Now if you read in Revelation chapter 18 verse 5, it's written there that the sins of Babylon have reached heaven and have come before him for a remembrance. And also if you read in Genesis chapter 15, there God tells Abraham, the children of Israel will not inherit the promised land until the sins of the Amorites are full. So sometimes God waits, you know, in his long suffering, he doesn't meet out judgments or chastisement immediately just as we sin once. No. He waits very patiently until our cup runs over. Till our cup is full, his mercy reaches over and over and over. 
But once it reaches the tip of flowing over, then that cup is brought before God, whether our individual lives or for the nation is brought before God and then according to the gravity of the sins and the transgressions, according to the justice of God, then judgments are meted out. And even if you read Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 9 and Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 24, it all talks about that the cup being full and the sins reaching before heaven and then God meets out judgment. So I saw that day this word came to me. The cup is almost full. Not full yet. Almost full. And it will come before God for a remembrance. She will then be humbled and made to eat dust. Now that phrase is something of a humbling experience. When you are made to eat dust, it speaks of a humbling experience, a, a experience of humiliation, that you, uh, you are made even to eat dust. In January 1st of 2012, you know, as I was praying, I saw an angel flying over the United States of America. And when he flew, he was just blowing into the air. When he blew, he said, tornadoes will rip apart cities and dwelling places. Snow blizzard will cause devastation in such a manner, not in the long times of the history of the US. And you may recall all this having coming to pass in the last two years. Tornadoes and snow blizzard coming in such a great manner not in the long time of your history. Now, the question is this. Has all this humbled the nation to repentance? No. no I didn't say that. <laughs> now you said it. Has all this humbled the nation? No. Now you are the sons and daughters of this soil. This the word came out of your own mouth. You know, let me tell you one naked truth. There are many angels standing in our midst and they have just bad record or witness to what you yourself have said out of your own mouth. You yourself have testified to what is taking place in this land. One particular angel, I see him standing in our midst. He's at least about eight feet tall with a book and an ink horn in his hand and he's writing every word that I'm speaking and every reaction that you're making and every thought that is coming out of your mind that is affirming what I am saying. So, has all these things, these tragedies, these catastrophes that came upon the nation, humbled the land? And you said no. And instead of humbling in repentance, we had lots of Christian leaders in the land who explain all this away. No, these are not judgments. No, these are not that. No, these are not that. Our God is a good God. Why would he want to send a tornado to wake us up? Why would he want to allow the Twin Towers to go down to ashes so that we will wake up? You know, the only way for this nation to be found righteous in the eyes of God is for you to get rid of all these false teachers and false prophets. If you get rid of all these false teachers and false prophets from your land, your land will be a beautiful bride before the Lord. But they will not go away because 
there is a huge bunch of believers who love them. They like their ears to be eached. They like to be milked. You know, been milking? <laughs> you know, I come from the land of the holy cows. morning, people who own cow farms, they milk the cows and they go to sell. And the cows, I don't know how much you have seen, but I've noticed, they don't move anywhere. They just stand in their places, in the farm, in their, all their appointed places, and this uh, servant comes. And he sings some lullabies <laughs> while he's milking the cow. <laughs> he sings some lullabies and he speaks some nice words of comfort, edification, make the cow feel good. <laughs> Once the cow feels good, it's, it doesn't realize that it's been milked and duped. Isn't that what is happening? Yes. How sad. Yes. How sad. Even though God has raised up many, many sincere, true prophets from within your own land. They are not the big name ones, you know. They are the faceless, nameless, faceless, selfless kinds. Prophets like David Wilkerson and our brother Terry Bennett here and so many other prophets, true prophets who don't run after fame or glory or anything. But their voices are not largely heard. But you flock to Stadiums, large churches, where you are just milked. And you, yes, you want to hear that which you want to get. You feel good. You know, this is the saddest part. Why this nation is going down the drain? Why is it not climbing up? It's because of this. There aren't, so to speak, ten righteous people. There aren't. You know, I'm not specifically saying in number ten, you know. A figure of speech. There aren't ten righteous people. Abraham hoped and he prayed and he stopped at ten. He had so much of great faith in his nephew, Lord, that he had done some good ministry in Sodom and Gomorrah, that he had a thriving church of more than 10 believers. Even his own household did not believe him. His whole household. His son-in-laws did not believe him. His married daughters did not believe him. Even his wife and two virgin daughters had doubts. Though did not totally disbelieve him, they were lukewarm. So that makes it only four. But because of Abraham's prayers, yeah. you know, their blood relation, you know, because of Abraham's prayer, God saved Lot and his family. But the entire city, twin cities, were destroyed. Now, because of false teachers and false prophets coming up with false teachings, what kinds of false teachings that have come up so far? Seeker-friendly church doctrines? Chrislam? 
and hyper grace doctrine that says anything goes. It's all been nailed on the cross. Everything nailed. All your past has been nailed. All your sins have been nailed. So whatever you do, even if you have more than 1,000 wives beating the record of King Solomon, that grace abounds. You know, this is milking the cow. And those who live in that kind of sinful lifestyle, like that teaching, that's good. Let's go to the church. It makes me feel good because I don't have to crucify my flesh. I don't have to give up my sin. And yet I can have religion. I can still take communion and not feel convicted. I can still come to my pastor for prayer. I can have him lay hands on my head. I can have him prophesy over me. Yet, I don't have to be exposed of my sins. I don't have to be convicted of my sins. Because there's no sin. Anything goes, everything goes. You know, this is what took place at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses was up on the mount talking with God. If you read Exodus, <coughs> if you read Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 7, there it says that when Moses was up on the mount talking with God, the people below the mount, instead of waiting on God for Moses, like how Joshua had done. You no, know, one thing very remarkable about Joshua. Why was Joshua chosen to succeed Moses? God called Moses to wait on him for 40 days and 40 nights. But Joshua chose to wait on Moses. Moses waited on God. Joshua waited on Moses. Every time Moses would go into the tabernacle to talk with God. You will find Joshua right beside the doorway, waiting for Moses. Even after Moses had left the tabernacle, Joshua will still be there, trying to get the wind of the anointing to brush all over him. And God saw that, you know, his faithfulness, his truthfulness. And God saw that he is the rightful candidate to succeed Moses. So that should have been the duty or the call or the responsibility of the rest of the Israelites. They should have been silently, patiently waiting till Moses came. But they found that this Moses was not coming. So what did they do? They took off all their goals. Please notice this carefully. They took off all their goals, that which was very precious to them, that which cost them something, that which was dear to them. They took off all their goals, they gave it to Aaron, they gave it to a priest, and the priest made a golden calf. What was that? A worship of their own creation. They didn't want to worship the creator. They created a religion. A religion of their own creation. Islam is not from God. Sikha friendly doctrine is not from God. These hyper grace doctrines are not from God. It's an invention. Our own invention, the golden calves that we have built in this 21st century. We have built them. And, and we are profiting from them. Instead of worshipping God in holiness that demands the crucifying of the flesh and worship 
God in spirit and truth, we have done away with all that to worship a God that will testify our flesh. If you look at the passage there, what were they doing, you know? They were having a party. They were partying, they were fornicating, they were engaging in orgies, they were doing all kinds of sexual sins in the name of religion. Now, they give their gold. That's what people are doing today. They're giving, throwing their money to all these false teachers, to all these false prophets who have made a golden calf and say, come and behold your God who has led you forth thus far. That's what they said that day. These are the gods. Behold your gods who brought you out of Egypt. And isn't that what we are doing today? We are bowing down to these man-made doctrines, these man-made traditions, traditions, these new things that we have made, we are bowing down and say, these are our redeemers. We are saying that today. These are our redeemers. This doctrine will redeem us. It doesn't work that way. My dear brothers and sisters, all these catastrophes, all these tragedies that have come so far, have not humbled the nation. Even when you were humbled, it just lasted for a few days. Maybe a few weeks. Give and take a few weeks. When the Twin Towers came down, all the churches were filled to overbringing, you know. But how long did it last it? until the fear got cooled off. Until the fear got cooled off, we were back to our old tricks. On August the 6th, 2014, that was yesterday, and during the worship, I saw my soul in heaven, and I stood before four angels, and the chief among them spoke to me. The nation's destiny, meaning the destiny of the U.S., is going to be determined. It's never pleasant for our Lord to chastise a nation, a leader, or an individual. You know, when he spoke that word, I looked at the angel's face. There's so much of concern. You know, though angels are sexless, but they are not emotionless beings. The scriptures say they cry. The scripture says they pray. If you read Zechariah chapter 1, there you'll find an angel pleading with God. Praying, Lord, how long more? How long more will you wait? Just like how we would pray, like how we would plead. We read the angel praying and pleading before God. But we don't, we should not pray to them. But they have their own duties to do. You know, all the different classes of angels, they all are of different characters makes beings responsibilities they are not emotionless like how we have been wrongly taught to think they feel you know they they feel they sympathize they can joke they can laugh they can play yes so i looked at his face so much of concern when he said it is never pleasant for the Lord to chastise a nation, a leader, or an individual. And he, as he spoke that, I saw before the throne of the Lord books, 
many books placed before him. And the books showed the iniquities and the transgressions of the United States of America that have reached up to heaven to be judged. And when the Lord saw all that, a great sorrow came over his face and he turned to its right away from the books and he wept. He wept. Because he will have to chastise. I saw that, you know, he wept. Let me tell you one honest truth. I first came to the U.S. in 91. And when I came in 91, the Lord called me to fast for 40 days for the United States of America. And at that time, the, the elect, presidential election was going on. And from that time till now, I have prayed on and off for the United States of America. But I've never ever cried that much like last night. I just looking at that, the tears started flowing down all over my eyes. And all during the worship, I kept on wiping away my tears, seeing the agony on the face of the Lord Jesus and the great love. He doesn't want to do it, but he will have to do it. I just couldn't stop the tears welling up in my eyes and flowing over and over again. He turned his face to his sight and he wept. When I saw that, I then understood one other thing. This was the same thing that happened when the Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross. At that moment when he cried, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? That was the time when the father himself turned his face. Because now the final judgment, all the sins are put on the sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice is going to be burned now. And when black smoke rises up, you cannot see, you know. He turned his face away. It's never pleasant to chastise. You know, farmers or shepherds do this. When there is a sheep or a cow that is very disobedient, that is, doesn't listen to the shepherd or the cow herd, what he says. He may just beat her once or twice and then talk to her nicely. Even when all else fails, for the good of the sheep or the cow, the shepherd breaks her leg. You know that? He breaks the leg. This is commonly done by shepherds. They break the leg. And the sheep will cry. And the shepherd will hug the sheep to his bosom, trying to let his heart bear all the pain of the sheep and make the sheep to know that this breaking was done with love, in love. Then the shepherd sits down on the ground and places the sheep on his lap and he takes a bandage and he binds the broken bones of the sheep and until the sheep's legs is healed he carries the sheep on his shoulder he never lets it down he carries on his own shoulder he chastises and he heals you know, I cannot forget the scene that I saw last night. How the Lord turned his face and he cried. I cannot take, take it away from my mind and from my eyes. 
each time I recall, I feel the breaking inside me. And it could hardly contain the tears from flowing out of my eyes. That amount of great love. You know, when you read in the Bible that God is love, you'll never know how great his love is until besides tasting it yourself, but until your spiritual eyes are opened and you see the Lord Jesus, how he reacts with compassion, with love. You know, in the many, many encounters I had with the Lord Jesus, the most memorable to me, besides what I had experienced last night, was about 10 years ago, a dear pastor friend of mine, his wife was dying. She was diagnosed with a hole in the heart, which could not be repaired by doctors. And she went through a surgery and the doctor accidentally caught one of her valve and further caused a greater damage to her heart and she was due for another surgery. And in the second surgery, the doctor frankly told her husband, we cannot promise that your wife will leave during the surgery. We must tell you ahead of time that she can die on the operating table because of the severity of the condition of our heart. And if at all the surgery succeeds and she leaves, it will only be for two or just three years, period. Nothing more than that. So nevertheless, they agreed for the surgery and uh, they were prepared that the woman will die on the operating table. So, they are my very close family friend, you know. So the wife, she had, she told her husband, I have one last dying wish. So he asked her what? She said, can you ask Brother Sadhu to come and pray for me before I am wheeled into the operating table? I would want his blessings before I die. So the poor husband started crying, you know. And he called me. I was on my way to Tibet. So I asked him, when is the date of the surgery? He said, all right, I will stop over to visit your wife before I go back to India. So I went to the hospital early in the morning at 7. And they had one small little boy, five years old, only son. And he was happily playing, running around everywhere. I looked at the boy, this little boy, is going to lose his mother in just two hours. And he didn't know that. He's just running around, playing everywhere. It broke me, you know. And, and the pastor's wife is, is only 32 years old. And I looked at the pastor, my dear friend. He's going to be a widower after a few short years of marriage. Probably he may remarry but the second woman may not be as good as the first wife. <laughs> so I looked at all that, and then I looked at this woman. She was trying to hide all her fears, all her concerns. She was just trying to smile through. You know how sometimes we bluff by smiling. So. After all the nice deeds were over, it's time for prayer. So I closed my eyes. I thought about all these things. As I keep on thinking, I felt my heart was breaking to pieces. At that moment, I saw the Lord Jesus. He came and stood by my side. And he asked me, what do you want? I said, Lord, please look at your daughter. You know, this lady, she was seated on the hospital bed and she put her face in her hands while I was praying and she was crying. You know, the Lord Jesus, who was standing on my right side, 
he walked out, came and sat on the bed, and he bent his face to her face level so that he could see all her tears flowing down from her cheeks and dropping onto the bed. And all throughout my prayer, for 20 minutes I prayed, reminding God of all the promises that he had spoken over the family. One by one I reminded the Lord all these promises. I said, Lord, how are all these promises going to be fulfilled if she dies? So please extend her life for another 15 years. When this boy, her little son, was in her womb, two months old, the Lord showed, showed me about this boy's life. I was taken to heaven and I showed, I saw his entire life up to his 25th birthday. So I told the Lord, should not the mother be alive to see all that Lord Jesus? So the Lord Jesus looked at me and he said, because you asked, I will extend her life. Tell her she will leave. And you know, saying that, he wiped away all her tears, just like a loving father, like a loving mother. He wiped away all her tears and he walked away. This is the God of love that you and I worship. This is our king, not just a king, but he's a priest. That's what the Bible tells, you know, in Zechariah chapter 6 verse 13. He's both a king and a priest. That is why he can be moved with compassion, moved with compassion. For anything that we ask, for anything we say, even though he has to stretch out his hand to chastise, on the other hand, his heart bleeds and the tears roll down from his eyes, like how the shepherd breaks the sheep's leg. Early this morning, as I got up to pray, as is my custom at two in the morning, so from two o'clock up to five, I was waiting on God. And at five o'clock, I felt the presence of the Lord come and sit on the bed before me. And then I opened my heart and started talking with the Lord over many other issues about my own personal life. I should not always be praying for other people, you know. I should also talk to the Lord about myself. Just heart to heart talk between father and son. Not, not business, no business. Just family talk how I feel, what I like, I don't like. And then he was just lovingly listening to all I said. And every now and then, he made some remarks. And at, the, at, at six o'clock, he said, all right, I'm leaving now. So I was going to finish my prayer when I felt a check in my spirit, continue waiting. You will have a visitor now. So as I waited, after a few minutes, the Prophet Moses walked into my room. And he came and he sat on the very spot where the Lord Jesus had sat. And I looked at him. And I asked him, Sir, what do you want to speak to me? 